covering rule three, part two, uh, referring, talking about timeouts and uh, authorized conferences and we'll get to substitution. So our goal is to finish out to today on rule three so we can start on rule four next week. All right, so last um, last week we we ended up talking about two ways for a uh, coach to call a timeout. Uh, the one of the first ways we talked about is like advance heads up to get you a hands up. Hey, I want to call a timeout after this down is over, uh, so he can save some time. I said one of the ways, potential ways a coach can lose time on a timeout is to wait to a random time to call a timeout because we're actually supposed to get a visual contact. According to the case book, we should get a visual contact um, with the, the requesting coach before we grant the timeout. And the reason why, because according to the National Federation High School rules, on the sideline, the coach or his designee are the only ones allowed to call a timeout. So, this so if an assistant coach calls the timeout, um, we're not supposed to grant that. It's supposed to be only the head coach or his designee or her designee on the sideline. So when we hear a timeout on the sideline, we should make visual contact before we get it. Now I wanted to expound on this a little bit more um, when I was preparing for this week and just going through a couple of other slides and preparation. I found this slide. And this is then this come into the the common sense uh, parameters of officiating. And that's time sensitive situations end of the second and fourth period. It says late in the second and fourth period, game officials should be aware of the situations in which coaches may wish to request timeouts. Factors impacting time remaining in the game include score, field position, available timeouts, injury and penalty timing. A quick glance to the sideline in those situations can save valuable seconds. So in this scenario, um, even though the coach didn't give you an advance warning, having common sense, know where we at in the game, just giving a glance back at the coach hey, and, and seeing, you know, if he's getting the a nod, he's getting the signal. Um, this doesn't want to make sure that I'm not sending officials out and they're like, well, if he don't give me an advance warning and I'm going to take my time, get my visual contact, and I'm going to, you know, no, we want to make sure that we look back. It's all about saving time. We don't want to be the reasons why a team uh, had a, didn't, didn't have an opportunity to either tie the game or win it. So we want to make sure that we do all we can as game officials to uh, help with the that factor. And I hope that makes sense and expound upon what we talked about last week. So let's move on. Okay, so doing these timeouts and also doing official timeouts, uh, their coaches are allowed to have authorized conferences with their um, their teams, all right? And it can be uh, for a charge timeout, for an official timeout, um, if granted by the referee doing a big five officials timeout, and we're going to talk about what those big fives are. That just, I'm just clear. I'm just, that's my, my terminology, the big five. And we'll, we'll discuss that here in a second. But um, if, if the referee uh, grants the big five timeout, uh, the coaches can also have an authorized timeout. Now, only one type of authorized team conference may be held, uh, may be used during any charge timeout, any officials timeout, and only an outside nine yard mark conference may be held for a big five officials timeout. And and rule three five eight C it talks about that. Now, what do we mean by only one type of conference? And we're going to, again when we get to that, I guess I discuss it then. But only remember, only one type of authorized conference can be held. Now here go to the two authorized team conference timeouts 
there's two types. There's outside the nine yard mark conference. That's when one or more team members and one or more coaches directly in front of the team box within nine within nine yards of the sideline. So that means they're they're close to the sideline. Um, they can have multiple coaches in that conference, multiple players, players can come off the benches in that conference. It's just a, a conference where you got more than one coach talking to the players. Now the other one is between the yard the nine yard mark conference. Only one coach on the field to confer with no more than 11 players at his team's huddle between the nine yard marks. Now, let's go back. The outside nine yard mark conference, that's talking about the only thing you can have during the big five. And we'll talk, again, we'll talk about the big five and three, five, 10. But only that one may be used when there's an injury timeout or one of the timeouts that we have to grant uh, for for a particular reason. Um, in between the nine yard marks, only one coach is allowed and three attendants. That's not a coach. So a coach can't grab a water bottle and call them a water attendant, um, which they're not. They're a coach. They're not allowed to grab the water. It has to be someone that's, a, that is in, that's um, operating in a non-coaching um, role. Also, when we said only two, only one of these conferences can be used. So in other words, if a team calls a timeout and let's say a coach goes into the middle to talk to confer with his team and then a couple of players run to the sideline to talk to another coach, that is actually having two conferences at once. It's not allowed. So either they're going to be in the middle or they're going to be on the sideline. The best bet and to, and to really say, because it will be an unsportsmanlike conduct if they try to hold two conferences at one time. And as a game officials, we should do everything possible to prevent that, right? Again, we're not there to try to throw every flag we can throw. And so if we can, my wing officials, if you see a, a player trying to run to the sideline to talk to another coach, that's not allowed, right? And you can't say, okay, I'm gonna start off with a, a between the nine yard mark conference, and then I'm gonna switch it over to an outside nine yard mark conference. That's not allowed. So whatever conference you start off with is the one that you have to only continue during that particular timeout or ref officials timeout. Now let's say they call another timeout. Well, if they call another timeout, then they could change their, their parameters on their conference, all right? So as my wing officials, and that's what basically this, in this general overview course, we are also looking at training our wing officials, our headlines and a line judge. It's very important to know that you prevent that from happening. All right. And we're going to talk about mechanics here shortly, but just understand it's your responsibility to ensure that the coaches don't try to use two different type of conferences or any of those other little things like that. Okay. All right. Timeout mechanics. Now for my new, my new officials. All right. We use the word mechanics and a lot of times, you know, when I'm trying to, as, a, as an instructor, as a teacher, I always try to define things or make, make it make sense. And so when it get down to mechanics, obviously the game official manual doesn't define mechanics. And we all have like our own, like, well, mechanics is this and mechanics is that. But if you know me, I'm always trying to give every word a definition and every word a meaning so that when we, and when I, when we say it, we all on the same page and we know what we're talking about. So this is my definition of mechanics. Mechanics is a system game officials use to communicate, determine area of focus like keys and field position and in our movements during a contest. So that's what we mean when we're talking about mechanics, right? How we communicate with one another on the field, verbally as well as visual. There should be a lot of verbal communication and we will talk about that when we get to the mechanics portion. Um, how we who we look at on the field. Uh, are we look are we ball watching or do we have a specific area that we are responsible for doing before the snap and after the snap? And then when the ball is snapped, where do I go? Do I stay here? Do I move down the field? Am I supposed to be in a certain place? Think of it as kill uh Choreographics like a dancer or choreographics like a stunt 
fighter, right? We have things to do. And, you know, a lot of time I see a lot of officials and it's look like they don't know their part, right? It's like dancing, right? We pose the, we have core graphics that we have to do. You And we need to rehearse that. That means, you know, you ever seen a, a, a dance routine? They, 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 they rehearse it, they do a dress rehearsal, and then they do it live. And a lot of time game officials don't know that, yes, we have core graphics that we're not just out there just standing around. There's things that we're supposed to do. Like, did you know there's, there's a certain way we're supposed to spot the ball, right? The rule, the, the mechanics, we're supposed to spot the ball with our downfield foot. There's, it's actually mac, uh, micromanaging ways that we're supposed to do things on the field. So that's the whole purpose of this training, to teach you, to show you what you're supposed to be doing on that field, not just standing there, not just being in, in limbo, like just I'm running behind the ball and I'm supposed to spot the ball. There's a lot more to do it. And there's a lot of times why when I'm doing games and I'm always talking to you is because, hey, yeah, you, you, it's something you're supposed to be doing that you may not be doing that you may not know you're supposed to be doing. So that's why we're doing this training to help you understand what you're supposed to do as a game official. All right. So let's look at some of the timeout mechanics of a game official. All right. When this portion here, it, we're talking about visualization. So in 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 mechanics, uh, and a, a good practice to do is when we're talking about mechanics and we're talking about things you should be doing. Uh, uh, the way to drive it home and to make sure you got it is to visualize it before you even do it. So as we as we talk about mechanics, it says that when you throw when, when there's a foul to play, you put throw your flag and call timeout. Well, then work on those visual mechanics. Throw your flag and, and go through the mechanics at home with your eyes open, eyes closed, but see yourself doing it before you have to do it. And so many times I see officials They'll throw a flag and they'll walk in. I'm like, that's not the protocol. You're not doing it right. You don't, you're not doing your core graphics correctly. You're supposed to throw the flag, blow your whistle, and give the timeout signal twice. Okay? That's what we all supposed to do. In a change of possession, I see officials running in, throw their hand up. Wrong mechanics. You're supposed to stop the clock. Okay? So if you work on these things, and you practice things and visualize it at home, it works. So I'm gonna show you something here. It says, why visualization is important. Visualization is important because it helps to prepare and to teach you how to respond to a situation before it happens. It also helps to achieve your goals by conditioning your brain to see, hear, and feel the success in your mind. So work on your visualization. You know, when I was doing baseball, I, I put a chair in front of me, and I'll get behind the chair and I call balls and strikes in my living room. Make sure I'm saying it right. Make sure I, I'm doing it right. I visualize the ball coming into the strike zone and I go, strike. Right? I'll do this at home. When I was doing basketball, I'll look in the mirror, and make sure I'm putting that that fist in the box. Am I am I doing my hand signals correctly? All these things is what we do as officials. Right? We don't just get out there and just be out there uh, all over the place. There's things we're supposed to be doing, and that makes a difference between a real official and a one out there just faking to be an official. All right, so let's look at some of the, the, the mechanics for a headlinesman line judge when it gets down to a sideline conference or a timeout conference. It says, move to a position halfway between the ball and your sideline and observe the team on your, on your sideline. So many times I see a timeout call and the official is perched perch on the sideline. The team is going past them. They're all over the place. All of them going in. They're all let's spread out throughout the field. And it's because the wing official did not know their care graphics. They did not know what they're supposed to do. So the best thing to do when a coach calls timeout, you walk in, you call timeout, you go to the numbers and you stop. If one coach go past you, that's fine. If you see multiple coaches come past you, and coaches, you have to stop there. Or you got to bring the team to you. You can't go past me. All right? So you're doing your job actively 
as what you're supposed to be doing as a game official. Not just sitting on the sideline, letting the teams go past you, and you just and you leave it up to the referee to, to get into that. That's your responsibility as a wing official. All right? Be alert for the whistle from the bike judge and five-man mechanics and the referee and four-man mechanics to give your team 15-second warning. Go to your team, huddle, and say, Coach, ball will be marked ready for play in 15 seconds. That's what you're supposed to do. Core graphics. I blow the whistle, 15 seconds. You go up to the team. Hey, Coach, you got 15 seconds for the ball ready, marked ready for play. Be alert for substitutes by, by your sideline or attempts to use substitutes for the purpose of deception and maintain proper number of players, attendance in the huddle when conferences are held between the nine yard marks. Okay. That's in the middle, right? Make sure there's only three attendants, none as coaches, one coach, and only 11 players. And this is, this is in the game of officials manual. Okay, let's get back over here. All right, all game officials. Now, this is a timeout that we all should be doing, and I want to bring out some points here. Repeat timeout signals twice. So I see some officials go at this one time. Anytime we give out a timeout signal, it should be twice. One, two, okay? Now, if you see my, my wing official, my opposite wing official, if you see me walking in giving a timeout, you also walk in and give the timeout. The umpire gives a timeout. The referee gives a timeout. Everyone gives a timeout signal. Okay. Two, record timeout, number of player who called it, or coach, timeout, time on game clock, and period. So we all supposed to keep track of that on our data card. Stay alert and erect. And if the most important one, do not visit with players. Restrict discussion with the captains. Don't be going there, get in the, in the, you know, you might want to try to say something to them, but that's the time that the coach called to talk to them, not for you to talk to them. And the most important thing, do not huddle in a group, right? Again, uh, even on this weekend, um, a lot of times I walked up, and when I walked up, I noticed my wing official was walking in. For whatever reason, I don't know, all right? So we don't huddle in a group. It's not our timeout. It's the coach's timeout. And we're not supposed to be coming in and, and having our own little huddle. A lot of times when we do that, we take longer than we need to take. Okay? So wing officials, you come in halfway and you stop. You don't go walk into the referee, the umpire. If the referee needed to ask you something, he'll walk over to you or he might ask you to come in right quick or her right quick. But let's stay away from all that group huddling in the middle of the field on a timeout. You come out, you stop, observe your team, all right, wait for the referee or back judge to let you know it's 15 seconds. Say, coach, you got 15 seconds for the ready for play. Urge them on, get everybody in position, and boom, we're ready to go. Okay, so when we when we get to the evaluation portion of your training, we're going to be looking for that. When the timeout call, we're going to see what you're doing. Are you doing the proper mechanics? All right, and you confirm the number of timeouts remaining you know uh blue has one uh green has two now if you ever work with me uh and I, I learned this a long time it's a method it's not a mechanic it's a method right method mechanics mannerisms but you know old school was uh and the reason why just why you don't say two and one or one and two because sometimes an official may not understand you, who you're saying one who you're saying two four and we say one and two, two and one. All right. It's best to give a team color or team name when you're discussing it. Tigers has two timeouts. Ravens have one timeout. Okay. It's, it really works and it really helps to do that. Now, I won't go and ding if you don't do it the other way. But I'll just let you know that's the really great way of doing it. And then also, you're going to let the coach know. Coach, you have two timeouts remaining. You have one timeout remaining. Really good to do that. Another good method is when a coach asks you how many timeouts I have left, a lot of times you might say one or two, and you may be incorrect. They might have none left. So before, when a coach asks you how many timeouts I have left, say, like, Coach, let me confer with my other crew members and make sure I got them. I, I think it's two, but let me confer real quick 
to let, make sure I, I'm not incorrect, that I didn't miss anything. That saves you from giving an incorrect number. And if they only have one timeout left, you say they have two, and they call it, and you and the referee say, hey, coach, you had a timeout. They go, hey, this ref told me I had one, one, two timeouts left in it. Just saves the the, 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 the hassles and all the miscommunication and the, and the resentment that coaches have toward officials already. So it's very good to just say, coach, let me confer with my other crewmates before I give you that answer. I think it's two, but let me confer. And then the end. All right, it's kind of blurry, but just going over a little bit more, doing the timeout, the referee remains in position in the offensive backfield. The umpire stands over the ball. The linesman and line judge should take positions midway between the ball and the respective sidelines. So this is how, this way we should be looking when a timeout. We shouldn't be all in the bunch in the middle. This how we this how our proper position mechanics that we should be at core graphics on a timeout. Okay, when we have a timeout in the middle of the field, it's almost the same. It's just a difference is we got one coach conferring with eleven players, maybe three three water attendants. But again. This is where we're supposed to be at on a timeout. Okay, charge timeout shall be reduced uh, in length only if both teams are ready for play prior to the ready for play being uh, uh, by be the referee. It should be by the referee. All right, so in other words, if the offense calls a timeout, they get one minute timeout. So defense call timeout. So offense, well, we only want 30 seconds. We're ready. And you'll see them rushing uh, to the ball like they're going to get this, like we're going to actually allow them to snap the ball before defense is ready. So, again, we wait. If the defense want to take the whole one minute, they're allowed to take the whole one minute. Now the offense needs to wait until defense is over. So it doesn't, it's not like volleyball where whoever called a timeout can shorten it. And football, one minute is one minute. All right. And then on injury timeout, again, um, the only authorized timeout they're allowed to have is on the sideline. Okay. They cannot be uh, in the middle. They can't use the inside uh, nine yard marks. They got to be on the outside. So typically we just say, just go to the, go to your, go to your sideline um, is a good practice. Just tell them to go there because you see coaches coming in trying to talk to them anyway. Go to the sideline and and then we'll we'll let you know when we're ready. All right, so this is in Rule Nine Eight One, but I I wanted to, I wanted to bring this out because we're talking about timeouts and authorized conferences. It says between downs, communication between players and coaches near the sideline are not considered conferences. So if the coach wanted to bring all those players over in between downs with, within the forty second play clock and give them instructions. He can do that, or she can do that. And you'll hear the other coach, is that a timeout? And you're like, no, coach, it's not calling a timeout. It's not considered a timeout. It's not considered a conference. It's a huddle. A huddle don't have to be in the middle of the field. The huddle can be anywhere on the field. It can be on the sideline. It can be in the middle of the field. It, 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 a huddle is a huddle, a conference is a conference. But just because players go to the sideline to talk to their coach who gives them instructions does not constitute a timeout or an or, or any type of illegal or authorized conference. Remember, the play clock is running, so it doesn't really matter. All right, so I think we covered this, but I'm gonna cover it again. Official timeouts. These are things that we that we call that. All right, so official timeout rule three five seven for measurements of possible first downs. Okay. So this is when we uh we call timeouts. We'll say, hey, you know, we go to a measurement. It looks close. We want to make sure that we're there. Um. Uh, when a first down is declared, we're gonna uh call a timeout just to stop the clock so we can move the chains. Following a uh, uh, change of team possession, although the clock is gonna stop no matter what, is actually considered to be an official timeout. Uh, when captains and coaches are notified of the time remaining, that's in the last four minutes. If there's no official clock, 
and the referee got let know that there's four minutes remaining in the second or fourth period. That's how that'd be handled. For a player in need of equipment and repair uh, to dry or change the football, for unusual heat and humidity, a coach referee conference is ruling a change. So if they call a coach referee conference and we 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 decide that yes they're correct and we and we change the ruling, then it becomes an official timeout and not a charge timeout to the team. Uh, after a foul to administer the penalty, that's an official timeout. So that's why it's important if you throw a flag that when the play ends. If you're the one that threw the flag, you should be blowing the whistle and giving the timeout signal. Many times, again, we see the flag thrown, and we see officials just walking in arbitrarily, like they don't know their core graphics. And they just walking in, hands down, pointing to the floor, whatever they're doing. But they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, stopping the clock. Okay? So if you want to be considered a serious game official, know your mechanics. All right, for any unusual delay, like like you know, let's say for some reason I'm having I'm having a hard I'm not able to get the ready for play signal going, I, I can stop the clock so that we're not on um using up time unfairly. All right, for a TV and timeout, obviously. Um, for one minute intermission between periods and following the scoring down prior to the free kick, all that's considered official timeout because we're not gonna let the clock run. All right. So, an automatic official timeout after a witch down. So, in the rules, in rule three, obviously, it says this. In rule 359, unless the game clock is already stopped, an official timeout shall be taken as soon as the ball becomes dead following a change of team possession or whenever the covering official declares that the ball is dead and it appears... To him, the ball has not reached the line of the game. So there's going to be either or, right? So what basically what he's talking about is fourth down. So on fourth down, we automatically going to, after fourth down ends, it's automatically going to be an official timeout. It doesn't matter because either going to be a first down or it's going to be a change of team possession. It's going to be either or after fourth down. Right. So again, and, and 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 again, it's not a mechanic, it's not in the, in the mechanics manual. Um, so this is a method and it's something that you can apply if you want. You don't have to. But a lot of times you'll see me do this. All right. That's to remind you that this is fourth down, and after fourth down, we all gonna stop the clock. Okay. So it's again core graphics, mechanics, you know. That is fourth down. As soon as the play over, we're all doing the stop clock mechanics. All right. Again, you could tell a real a trained official from an untrained official by little simple nuances, by simple mechanics. You could say, oh, that person was trained, that person wasn't trained. Honestly, it only take me five minutes to watch an official to know if they was properly trained or not. Okay. Because within those five minutes, I'm gonna see if they know their mechanics. All right. So what are the big five? Rule 10, run through three, rule three, five, 10. Uh, the big five, these are official timeouts. These are timeouts that the player has to go off the field for one play, at least a minimum of one play. Um, an apparent injury, injured player. Uh, a player who exhibits a concussion. And we're going to go back to that one here shortly. Uh, blood discovered on a player's a player or player's uniform. And, and blood on the on the person is one on a uniform is talking about the if, it, if the uniform is saturated blood. Little spots of blood is not what they're referring to. It's talking about the uniform like like have a really big spot of blood on it. And that and that's, that's to protect from blood patrogens. All right. The helmet the helmet comes completely off during the down or subsequent dead ball action related to the down without being directly attributed to a foul by an opponent. So if a helmet comes off and it hasn't, it wasn't due because of a foul by an opponent or something of that nature, then that player, that player has to go out for one play. Can't be bought in with a timeout. It has to be out. The player has to be out for one play. All right, and the player equipment is missing 
or improperly worn. So missing knee pads, which we see a lot lately, are improperly worn uniform. In other words, the shirt is up and the back flap is sticking out or they got the wristband where it's not supposed to be. Um, you know, it's not a foul. We call it a fissure timeout. They have to go get that fixed and, and correct it. And then after they can come back into the game. All right. So these are the big five. And uh, when we get to level one training, we're going to go back over this and do a little bit more exp expounding on it, but we're not going to do it now. But what I want to uh, talk about a little bit more about the concussion. Okay. So in the mechanics manual, it says that we as officials should know the signs of concussion. I'm just about to put it on here or not. All right. The player should be up one down. Okay. No, I did. All right. All right. Um, so part of your training, if you go on the uh, National Federation High School, nfhslearning.com, there's a, a course on there uh, for coaches and officials on concussion. There's another one called Heads Up, okay? So part of your homework assignment and a part of your responsibility is that if you have never taken it before and you're going to get a certificate, I want you to print that certificate out and stick it into your workbook. Take the concussion course, all right? It's just, it's just a really, really important to do as a game official so that you'll know what represents a concussion and we know if we see it, um, what we're supposed to do. Again, this this will be override coaches. They're like, oh, it's fine, let them in the fine. No, no coach, this player is done for the day. Unless some, some miracle, you get a medical professional to come in there and say that they're allowed to come back, authorize them to come back into the game, that, that game, that day. Uh, other than that, if we send somebody out for a concussion, they're basically done for the day. Ain't no coming back. Unless, again, a medical professional released them to come back into the game. Okay? So take the course, all right? NFHSlearning.com under concussion. Or you can look up Heads Up. Um, they got a concussion course there as well. Take the course. Take the little exam print out your certificate, stick it in your workbook. So when we do your workbook um, check, we'll see it in there and know you took it, right? So let's talk about the helmet. Again, I want to talk about this because there's a lot of bad information in the high school level and youth because we got a lot of officials who have not been properly trained. And so they assume they know the rules based off whatever because it's still on TV, I guess. All right. So found this online. Removing your helmet during a game of football can be costly as there is strict rules at most levels. Again, it says most levels of the game that players on the field cannot be unhelmeted. Removing your helmet on the field before, during, or after a play. I see your hand, Robert. We're, again, just write your comp, write your, your whatever you want to say, write it in the, uh, in the comments and then we'll get to it okay and my gosh his hand raising went right over my words hold on for a minute okay uh players uh celebrate with the helmet off and uh they also are not allowed to take their helmets off on the field on purpose this penalty is in place to keep the game running smoothly and to protect players so you're coaches all the time hey man Keep your helmet on the field. You hear ref, ref, game officials say it all the time, don't take your helmet off the field. And I, and, and I was like, is that a rule at this level? Is it a rule that says that a player can't take the helmet off on the field? So let's, 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 let's investigate. All right. So the first and foremost I want to do is talk about what is a rule. Rule two says a rule is one of the groups of regulation which governs the game. A rule sometimes uh, states what a player may do, but if there is no such statement for a given act, it is assumed that he may do what is not prohibited in the rule. So basically what it's saying is 
if the rule don't say that it's illegal, then it's not, right? So don't make something illegal because you want it to be illegal. If the rule doesn't say it, then that means it's allowed. If it wasn't allowed, the rule would tell you it's not allowed. Make sense? Okay, so let's look on what does the rule, what in the rule book, when, it, when it's just talking about helmets, what does the rule says about the helmet? When, it, when, it, when the helmet comes off, completely off the runner, it says when the helmet comes completely off the runner, the play is dead. Right? As soon as the helmet comes off its runner, it's over. Blow the whistle, play's dead, can't go no further. Rule 4, 2, 2K. It says that for a player whose helmet comes completely off doing a down, to continue to participate beyond the, the immediate action uh, in which the player is engaged in legal participation. Rule 964G, all right? It says, if you throw your helmet to trip an opponent, it's a personal foul. That, that had to be back in the day. That's just, just stuck in the rule book until now. But I, we, if anybody ever seen that, please tell me when we finish. But uh, to take your helmet off and throw it at an opponent is a personal foul. And to initiate contact with an opposing player whose helmet has come completely off is a personal foul. So this is all the rule book says about the helmet. Right? If you don't believe me, look it up for yourself. Be my guest. Okay? So the rule says that each player shall properly wear mandatory equipment while the ball is live. Okay? So it is not a foul to remove your helmet on the field of play doing a dead ball. So if it's a dead ball in between periods, a touchdown, if you take your helmet off, it's not a foul that we can call because it does not exist at the high school or youth level. In the NFL, yes. In college, yes. But don't be bringing that, those penalty codes to the high school and youth level because that's the only way you get your training, okay? Know what the rules say. That's the rule. All right, let's move on. So, no, it's not true. This is not a National Federation High School football rule. This is a national, this is a NFL rule. So if you go online trying to learn football, it's best that you get a rule book and learn through the rule book, okay? Let's move on. All right, coach referee conference. The referee confers with the coach at the sideline and in front of his team box in the field of play. All right, for what reason? Reviewing a decision that may be result that may have result from misapplication or misinterpretation of the rule may be requested by a player or head coach. A charge timeout will be given to the team, and if there if there is a correction, then we change it from a charge timeout to an official timeout. On the field of play in front of the team box. So that's what we hold is coach referee conference. So wing officials, core graphics, right? Mechanics. If a coach want to have a discussion with your referee and you see him trying to walk past you, you should be getting in front of that coach and telling that coach, coach, you can't go no further. The end discussion that the referee have with you would have to be in, on the field of play in front of your team box, not in the middle of the field. Again, we get wing officials who just perch on the sidelines and let coaches walk right by them. Like, don't even know what their responsibilities are. All right? So as a wing official, coach trying to walk by you? No, coach. What do you need? All right? If you're not willing to call a timeout, well, coach, I'll tell you what, the next day of ball, I let the referee know you want to speak with him. And he'll, and if, if he have time, he'll come over and talk with you, all right? But if you want to talk about a, a misapplication of a rule or misinterpretation of a rule, and you may even call the timeout for that, you have to remain here. The referee, the coach, the referee will come to you. You don't go to the referee, all right? All right, Al altering decisions. Notify opposing coach 
uh, change the charge timeout into an official timeout. So if we if we happen to make it, change the, the ruling um, on the field, then we'll let the opposing coach know that that there was a misinterpretation and misapplication. And you know, they'll get upset. Why are you letting them tell you what to do? You made it. You made your call, man. That's still you cheating. All the things they're going to say, but this is like the red flag in 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 uh, high school football, youth football. It's the coach referee conference. That's how we do our red flag. Okay, how the coach do a red flag, basically, metaphorically. All right. The shit. If now, if they if they come over to you and you, you don't change your decision. Again, the team is charged a timeout. Okay. Now I want I want I want to talk a little bit more about this because when I was preparing for this, there's a couple of things that came to my mind. And that's the reverse, the flip side of the coin. All right. The flip side of the coin is this. The the game officials don't know the rules. And they actually incorrectly apply the rule. Let's take the helmet on the field scenario, okay? So a player takes his helmet off the field. One one of the covering officials sees it, throws, blows the whistle, and call uh, unsportsmanlike conduct on number 55 for taking his helmet off on the football field. And now we're about to, we're about to mark it off. But the coach said, wait a minute. I've been through PGO Academy training. And I know that this is not a foul. So he called a coach referee conference. And the referee go, he go to the referee say, hey, rep, that's not a rule. I've been through referee training. But the game official he's talking to has not been through training. Don't know the rules. So now we have a problem. Because how can we correctly apply this if the referee or the game officials are on that game, don't even know the rules. We always assume that the that the referee is right and the coach is wrong. But what if the coach is right and the referee is wrong? Give you another example. Back in the day, when we used to be in charge, when I was in charge of a lot of the national events that came to, to Florida, um, we had a team, we had a, a, a crew out of Chicago, and we had it was the Jags, and actually the Jags had us a lot, had myself and Tony and some of the other officials, right? And so we we normally teach our teams the rules as we go, right? Well, they had a game where they scored a touchdown, but the the runner taunted, threw his hand, threw his fingers up, did whatever he had to do, and the Chicago crew threw the flag on him. Well, they called back the touchdown for unsportsmanlike conduct. And we all know it's not National Federation High School rules. But hey, the coach called him over there. And I was there because I was in charge. Trying to tell the, the coach, the referee, that that's not a rule. You don't call back a touchdown for unsportsmanlike conduct. The referee didn't want to hear it. And still enforced it. So... That's why it's so important to be in PGO Academy. That's why it's so important that all officials be in some type of form of real training. So you're not doing, you're not misapplication of rules. You're not misinterpreting the rules because you see it on TV or somebody told you something and you never read it for yourself. And now we, that's where we have a disconnect. Okay. So it's very important that you know the rules so that when a coach bring you to the sideline, you know what you're talking about. The other thing that's important on this, that don't be, don't have an ego and have pride. If you really misinterpret the rules or mis there was a misinterpretation or misapplication, and you know that the coach is right, have the courage to alter your call. All I know you're gonna get a, a handful from the opposite coach. You're gonna get a handful from the parents. But that's your job. That's what you sign up for. And if one of your crew members misapply the rule, have the decency and the courage and the integrity to fix it. And not be, well, we're not going to change it because I don't want, uh, you know, uh, uh. No, if you're wrong, you're wrong. Right? Just makes sense.
All right, no timeouts remaining. So if the, if the crew didn't have no timeout, let's say they, it was a, a coach referee conference and it, it was no decision change and they don't have any timeouts, we're going to give them a delay of game, five-yard penalty for calling for having us do the coach referee conference, right? That's good. Let's move on. All right. So coaches is not permitted to question any judgment decision by the game official during a coach referee conference. So that wasn't pass interference. Okay, what's what's the misapplication and misinterpretation of the rule? I'm just letting you know, I don't think that was the pass interference. Well, that's a judgment call that the covered official made. We're not here for that, all right? So if it's not a legitimate coach referee conference, where they, they're actually discussing a rule, they just want to let you know that they're, you know, whatever, how they want to say it. Then guess what? This is, you know, okay, coach, got you. All right. It's your time out. And um, we'll move on. All right. I'm taking too long. All right. The ready for play signal, uh, ready for play signifies that the ball may be put in play by snap or by or a free kick with 25 seconds or 40 seconds on the play clock. Okay, the ball is ready for play. When the ball has been uh, been placed for a down and the referee marks the ball ready for play after giving the ready for play signal. All right, or the ready for play is starting immediately after the ball has been um, been ruled dead by the game official after a down, after a down, the ball has been placed on the ground by the game official and the game officials has stepped away to their positions. Now, number one is referring to a 25 second play clock and number two is referring to a 40 second play clock. All right, so when do we have a 25 second play clock? Prior to the try following a score. So after the score, the referee is gonna blow the ready for play. The team has 25 seconds to put the ball in play. All right, to start a period or overtime series, follow the administrator of an inverted whistle. So we have an inverted whistle and we got to bring the ball back or we, they put they keep the ball there. We're going to go to a 25 second play clock. Following a charge team timeout, have a timeout, have the timeout's over, 25 second play clock. Following an official timeout, following a legal kick when either team is awarded a new series, and uh, following a stoppage of play, um, the uh, the play clock by the referee for any other reason. All right. So um, a couple exceptions to this rule. To eliminate the potential timing of advantages gained by the defense, the rules committee approved that the play clock being set to 40 seconds when an official timeout is taken for an injury play, an injured player, a foul following administrative penalty, or an equipment issue related to a defensive player. So let's say, you know, we have a 40-second play clock and we have an injured player. On a defensive injured player, we got to stop everything. Well, we're going to go back to a 40-second play clock, not a 25-second play clock. We have a, 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 so a uniform issue and the play clock has to stop and it's having to deal with the, uh, the defense. We go back to a 40-second play clock. And let's say we have an uh, encroachment on the defense. We go back to a 40 second play clock, all right? However, if there's a, a um, I'm trying to figure out when there's a foul, uh, it's not really a multiple foul on the dead ball, but if there's a foul by the off, if it's like an injured player by the offense or uh, a foul on the offense, or, you know, let's say a, a double foul or equipment, if it had to deal with offense, then when we get ready to go, we go to a 25 second play clock, all right? So anytime we deal with the offense, the defense, they're going to go to a 40-second play clock. And I got nine minutes to hurry up. All right. A 40-second 40 uh, second will be on the on the play clock after the down, other than anything we just stated in the other ones, and it's uh, declared dead by a game official. Now, a couple of things here. Starting the 40-second play clock immediately is to uh, be interpreted as starting in the 40-second play uh, as quickly as the covering uh, official ends the uh, the down and give out the signal three, signal seven, or uh, signal ten. All right. So, at the end of a play, 
one of these signals should be given to start the play clock, okay? So even if you have a player that is down by the sideline, and we know we give the wine, all right? Before you give the wine, you should be either given a time timeout. You don't have to worry about giving the wine. But if it's a dead ball, it's a dead ball, and then you give the wine. Because the dead ball let them know that the play clock is supposed to start. If you do this first and then do this, you, it's actually in, in correct order, okay? So these are the, the only three signals you should be giving after any play, either incomplete pass. Now, signal three, it says timeout, but it's not, ne not necessarily a timeout because obviously a timeout and there's no play clock. But the timeout signals also means to stop the clock signal, all right? Uh, official timeout, so a first down. There's a first down. We're gonna I'm gonna give the timeout signal for a first down. The 40 second play clock starts. Okay. All right. Actions or inaction which prevents promptness and putting the ball in play is a delay of game. Includes failure to snap the free kick prior to the play clock expires. Unnecessary carrying the ball after it has become dead. Uh, a coach referee conference, uh, no change or right, no timeout, team timeouts, which we already discussed. Uh, snap, snapping or free kicking the ball before they're ready for play. Right. So the offense trying to snap the ball before you get ready, you could give them a delayed game. Typically, I never do, but you can. It's, it's the rule. All right. Any other undo on any other conduct which unduly prolongs the game, all right? And fair to unpower from a, uh, an opponent in a timely manner. Now, real quick, it's something that we should never allow. Let's say after a timeout, the defense is still conferring on the sidelines and the timeout is over. And, the, and you know, you always hear the well, offense don't have to work, don't have to wait on the defense. And I guess that's true in whatever that means. So, Sometimes the offense think they're gonna that we're gonna allow them to snap the ball and to run a play while the defense is not set up. That would never happen. Okay. So what should happen if if we, you know, the, the timeout is over, we're ready to go, we're blue to ready for play, offense is ready to go, and the defense is not ready. Okay. Well, if the offense is ready and they try to snap the ball. We're going to kill the play, and we're going to give a delay a game on the defense, okay? And this will fall under any other conduct which unduly prolongs the game. We're not going to allow the offense to snap the ball with no defensive player in position and run some go-ahead touchdown. Like we're trying to teach the defense a lesson. No, that's not what we do as officials, okay? So even though the coach be trying that, that, that baloney, that's not something that we condone our, our practice. All right, okay, definition. A player is one of the 22 team uh, members who is designated to start either half of the game and who subsequently replaces another player. A, subst a substitute is a team member who has replaced a player or filled a player vacancy. A replaced player is the one who has been notified by a substitute that he is to leave the field. All right, so again, is one of my objective is to to break through all the bad again the bad information that a lot of officials have out there, coaches included, about National Federation High School rules. All right, again, if you're watching, it, if your primary learning tool is to learn football, is watching the NFL or the NCAA, then you are going to be grossly wrong and some of the decisions you make on the football field because we don't go by their rules, right? We go by a whole different set of rules. So that's why this, this, this type of training is important because we don't want you to go out there misapplication and misinterpreting the rules, okay? So is it a foul to have 12 places in the offensive of huddle or even break the huddle with 12, all right? So between downs, any number of eligible substitutes may replace players. All right. 
a replaced player shall begin to leave the field within three seconds. Okay. So a good practice, that's, that's offense and defense. It's not just offense. So if the de of a defensive uh, 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 substitute come on the field to replace a defense, a replaced player, and that player don't leave the field within three seconds, technically that's, a, that's a, a dead ball illegal substitution foul. The same on offense, okay? These rules apply to both set, sides of the ball. Be alert after timeouts and, and change of possession. So on timeouts, you know, an extra player will come on the field, change of possession. You know, I need I want red offense out there and one of the blue offense go out there. All these different things happen. And that normally is it's not like somebody's actually being replaced. It's just they starting off like that. And typically I give them up to the snap to fix it. All right. So some of the restrictions. To leave the field at the side on which a team is located and go directly to his team box. So let's say uh, he goes out the end line. It's a dead ball it's a dead ball substitution foul. You can't go out the end line and then go around. You have to go out on your that whole sideline. You have to go out. Now you go out the end zone on your sideline, but you just can't go out the end line. Okay. But let's say you go out of bounds on the other people, the other team's sideline. Dead ball illegal substitution, right? You only can go out on your side. To become a player, then withdraw or withdraw and re-enter or a substitute ex uh, ex exception, penalty, dead ball foul, timeouts, or period ends. All right, be on his team side of the neutral zone when the ball is snapped or free kick. So let's say you're in his... I can never see this happen on an offense because they got they're controlling the snap. So I can't see the offense snapping the ball as one of their teammates is running from the defensive side, but I can see them snapping the ball if a defensive player running to their side was actually on the offensive side when the ball is snapped. All right. A replaced player must be off the field of, of, of the field of play before the snap and no substitute shall enter the field during a down live ball. All right. So um, the question is, is it a foul to have 12 on the field or break the huddle? In the Prep Football 2021 book, it's in the play three, it says this. It gives a situation. Team A has 11 players in the huddle when 12, A12 enters the game. After two seconds have elapsed, it, it, scenario one, A5 leaves the huddle and Team A subsequently breaks the huddle or as a uh, the huddle, the huddle breaks while there was 12 in the huddle and as 12 as a5 was leaving so you have two scenarios the ruling is legal in either case okay so because he left in within two seconds so and let's say i run to the huddle and as i'm running to the huddle and i tell a5 he has to leave and then we all break the huddle at the same time and a5 leaves the field it's not a foul because it's not it's no prescription there's no set um parameters in the national federation high school rules saying breaking the huddle with 12 is a foul remember don't add nothing to the rules if the rule does if the rule doesn't say it's a foul then that means it's permitted okay and i believe okay and so breaking the huddle the rule do not prohibit a team a from breaking the huddle with 12 12 or more players that's page 13 of prep football all right and field mechanics all right, we should always be counting. And this is something that I see a lot of officials don't do is count. Um, and this is the times you should be counting and who you should be counting, okay? And that's it. I've done it again, I think. Hold on for a minute.